Greetings everyone. Welcome to the 9 p.m. Bible study. Today is 30th April 2020, end of the fourth month. And we are doing the book of uh, Ephesians right now. And chapter 2 and verse 8 is where we are going to start off from. These are some of the amazing words in the scriptures. In fact, Ephesians 2, 8 to 10 is uh, a very popular passage and uh, it's used quite often to proclaim the glorious good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. So the next three verses, verses 8, 9 and 10, present a clear statement that the simple plan of salvation that God has given to us in the scriptures. You can't see this gospel presented clearer than this. Now there are three contrasts that are seen or implied and I ended my study yesterday with that. Grace as a principle is opposed to law. Faith is set over works and gift is contrasted with wages. Grace versus law, faith versus works, gift versus wages. Now some of the prominent passages uh, in which these truths are set out are generally found in the book of Romans and also in Galatians and let me read that out to you. They are fairly lengthy but bear with me. Romans 3, 26 to 30. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. On what principle? On that of observing the law? No, but on that of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too, since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. Romans 4, 14 to 16. For if those who live by the law are heirs, faith has no value and the promise is worthless because law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. And also finally, Galatians 3, 23 to 25. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. So let's start with uh, 2 and verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. In my uh, teaching ministry, I would have said it a million times. Because as I said earlier, the, there is no other phrase or statement in the, in the Bible that explains the gospel with such clarity. For it is by grace. It all originates with the grace of God. God takes the initiative in providing it. Salvation is given only, uh, pardon me, salvation is given to those who are unworthy of it, who are totally and utterly unworthy of it on the basis of the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is bestowed upon those who accept it. So it is by grace, purely by God's grace. God initiated our salvation process and it is purely by grace. For by grace you have been saved. You have been saved and you are now saved, says Paul. The tense of the verb here and also in chapter 2 and verse 5 suggests a completed action with emphasis on the present effort. In other words, salvation is given as a completed action. Salvation is given as a present possession. Uh, in other words, those who are saved will know it. 
You know, saved has a wide range of meanings. One is we are saved from eternal damnation. We are saved from God's anger or wrath. We are saved from God's uh, justice. Uh, we are saved from uh, eternal hellfire. You know, we are so many things from which we are saved. But uh, we are also saved from, our, uh, from the, the guilt of our sinfulness. So those who are saved can know this. If you are truly saved, you will know that you are saved. You don't have to wait till you die then to see whether you are saved or not. In certain other faith systems, you've got to die and then you know where you're going. But here, by trusting in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus, you can know for sure with absolute certainty that you are saved. For by grace you are saved through faith. So God has given us salvation as a free gift. And the way we receive this free gift of uh, eternal life is through faith. We have to exercise faith. God is offering this gift. We can reject it. We've got to believe in it and accept it. Remember, faith is belief in action. So believing that the Lord Jesus is God, he is the son of God, and believing that he came to die for our sins and he paid the penalty for our sins, and then accepting him as our personal Lord and Savior is what is going to save us. And the verse continues to say, and this is not from yourselves. So any idea that a human being can earn or deserve salvation is forever exploded by these words. Now, dead people can do nothing. Those who are spiritually dead cannot be saved on their own. Sinners deserve nothing but condemnation and punishment. So salvation doesn't come to us because of our good deeds or we have been good people. No, it is, the verse continues to say, it is the gift of God. A gift, as you know, is free and unconditional. Gift is something that you cannot work for. You cannot earn it. So it is only on the basis of this that God offers salvation. The gift of God is salvation by grace through faith. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. Death is earned by, by us because it's the wages. Wages are something that you earn. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So remember that you earn your death. I earn my death. Because we sin, we die. But we have eternal life because we accept the gift that God has given us in Christ Jesus our Lord. And uh, it, uh, the gift of God, of salvation, is offered to all people everywhere. It doesn't matter whether you are born into a Christian family or a Muslim family or a Buddhist family or Hindu family. Any family that you are born into, it's not your choice that you are born into those families. But every single one of us needs salvation. And God is offering this free gift to everyone. Uh, regardless of our ethnicity, our religious uh, leanings, our nationality, our color of skin. God is no respecter of persons. Verse 9, it continues. Not by work so that no one can boast. Now salvation is not something that can be earned through meritorious deeds. It cannot be earned for instance, for example, by baptism or confirmation or church membership or church attendance, a holy communion, keeping the Ten Commandments uh, or do, going on a pilgrimage, uh, living according to the Sermon on the Mount, uh, giving to charity. These are all good things. But they will not give us our salvation. We are not saved by works. Nor are we saved by faith and works. We are saved only by faith. Man or human beings are saved only through faith alone. So if anyone could be saved by his own works, then the death of Christ was absolutely unnecessary. Then God has certainly made a mistake. God forbid. So if there was any other way by which God could have saved us, if we could have saved ourselves, God would have revealed it to us. But there was no other way. Somebody had to pay the price for our sins, the penalty for our sins, because every single human being born into, the, into this world is a sinner. Galatians 2 and 21, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained by the law, Christ died for nothing. Righteousness cannot be gained through the law. So this verse goes on to say, chapter 2 and verse 9, not by work, so that no one can boast. 
Since salvation is through faith alone, human boasting is totally not possible. Faith excludes boasting because it is non-meritorious. Romans 3.27 Where then is boasting? It is excluded. On what principle? On that of observing the law? No, but on that of faith. A Christian glorifies in nothing but Christ. So if we, have, if we can earn our, works, uh, earn our salvation through works and go to heaven based on our works, heaven will be full of boasters. But heaven will not have a single boaster because all of us will realize that we have come into God's presence purely by the work of Christ. And this builds, verse 10 builds on verses 8 and 9. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. For we are God's workmanship. Now Paul now sums up, the, uh, looking for, or sum, uh, sums up by looking forward to the purpose of all this activity. Why is God saving us? Because we are God's workmanship. A born-again believer, a true believer in Jesus Christ, is a masterpiece of God. Considering the raw materials that God has to work with, that is us, his achievement is all the more remarkable. God takes us, fallen sinners, and he changes us, he breaks us down, he molds us or remolds us into the image of Christ. He does amazing things in our lives. If only we would let him work in our lives, he will recreate the image of Christ in our lives. And that should be one of the main purposes in life for us. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Now remember, the material creation was created by Jesus Christ. The new creation is created in Jesus Christ. Let me repeat that. The material creation that we see around us was created by Jesus Christ. The uh, new creation, that's us, we are created in Christ Jesus. First one, the material creation was created by Jesus Christ, Colossians, 1, 1, uh, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. But the new creation, as I said, is created in him. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Now, why did he, God, make us his workmanship and create us in Christ Jesus? There is a reason. To do good works which God prepared for us to do in advance. We were created to do good works or we were saved to do good works. Good works are the outcome of salvation. Now, good works are not the root of salvation, but the result or the fruit of salvation. Let me say that again. Good works are not the root of salvation, but it is the fruit of salvation, the result of salvation. James chapter 2 verses 14 to 16 what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? So good works do not save us. They are not the root of our salvation. They are the result of our salvation. Now, to do these good works, the Bible says, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, these good works that we are supposed to do are prepared by God ahead of time. It is reassuring to know that our lives and our works are definitely planned by God. God has a blueprint for every life. Now, before our conversion, before we came to know the Lord, he mapped out a spiritual career for us. Now our responsibility is to find his will for us and to obey it. 
So it's amazing really to know that God has a blueprint for every life, for yours and mine. So we have enormous potential and God has a fantastic and a great plan for us in the spiritual realm. And we can become victorious believers in Christ. We can be what the Lord Jesus will call as well done, you f good and faithful servants. And God will reward us. We can become Christ-like if only we would completely yield ourselves to God. Now, we do not have to work out a plan for our lives, but only accept the plan that God has drawn up for us. 1 Peter 2.21 To this you were called and uh, pardon me, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. So this ensures that our lives will be of maximum glory to God, of most blessings to others, and, the, uh, and of greatest reward to ourselves. Let me repeat that. This ensures, that is, when we come to the Lord and we seek out his plan for our lives and we fulfill his plan and his will in our lives, this will ensure that our lives will bring, bring maximum glory to God. It will be of most blessing to others who are in our lives and it will be of greatest reward to ourselves. So God is glorified, God benefits, others are blessed, they also benefit and we are rewarded. So there is a benefit for us as well. So there is no way we can lose. Everyone gains as a result of this. Therefore, we must diligently fulfill God's plan and carry out the good works that God has called us to do and obtain a full reward. Second John verse 8, watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. So God's order is this, faith leads to salvation, which leads to good works, which lead to rewards. Faith leads to salvation, salvation leads to good works, and good works lead to rewards. Now, in order to find out the good works that God has planned for us to do in our individual lives, there are a few things that we need to do. One, we must forsake and confess sin. Or rather, I'll put it the other way around. We must confess and forsake sin. We must get rid of sin from our lives. Be continually and unconditionally yielded to him. Yield yourselves completely, co continually and without any conditions. Yield yourselves to God. Study the word of God to discern his will. That's a primary way in which God speaks to us in the age of grace, in the church age. Spend time in prayer each day because we will hear God's voice in that still small sound. Seize the opportunities for service as they arise. We notice that when Barnabas approached Paul, Paul was ready to serve God. And that's why God gave him a great ministry. So whenever opportunities come your way, take hold of those opportunities for service and cultivate the fellowship and the counsel of other believers. So let me roll out these uh, particulars just to uh, remind us again. In order to find out the good works that God has planned for us, we need to do the following things. One, for, uh, confess and forsake sin. Because if there is sin, is, there is like a, a glass shield between God and us. Perhaps we can see him, but we cannot, God doesn't hear us. So we must confess and forsake sin. Be continually and unconditionally yielded to him. Study the word of God to discern his will. Spend time in prayer each day. Seize the opportunities for service as they arise. Cultivate the fellowship and counsel of other Christians. Now we were dead in our sins and in our trespasses. But God's activity in grace in dealing with us in this state is expressed with a triad of wit or S-Y-N in Greek as I said yesterday, sin, S-Y-N. He made us alive with Christ. He raised us up with Christ and he seated us with him in the heavenly realms. 
all in Christ. Nothing is uh, possible for us without the Lord Jesus Christ. So that brings us to the end of this part that is about the church in an individual way. Now we are going to look at the church in a collective way, the construction of the church collectively. But before that, I want to read to us a lovely hymn. Uh, Horatius Bona wrote this hymn many, many years ago. And uh, listen to this very carefully. Hear, O my Lord, I see thee face to face. Here would I touch and handle things unseen. Here would I grasp with firmer hand thy grace and all my weariness upon thee lean. Here would I feed upon the bread of God. Here drink with thee the royal wine of heaven. Here would I lay aside each earthly load. Here taste afresh the calm of sin forgiven. This is the hour of banquet and of song. Here is the heavenly table spread anew. Here let me feast and feasting still prolong the brief bright hour of fellowship with thee. I have no help nor do I need another arm to save thine to lean upon. It is enough, O Lord, enough indeed. My strength is in thy might, thy might alone. Listen to this carefully. Mine, mine the sin, but thine the righteousness. Mine, mine the guilt, but thine the cleansing blood. Here is my robe, my refuge and my peace. Thy blood, thy righteousness, O Lord my God. I want to repeat that verse again. Mine, mine the sin, but thine the righteousness. Mine, mine the blood. Uh, mine, mine the guilt, but thine the cleansing blood. Here is my robe, my refuge and my peace. Thy blood, thy righteousness, O Lord, my God. Too soon we rise, the symbols disappear. The feast, though not, the love is past and gone. The bread and wine remove, but thou art here, nearer than ever, still my shield and sun. Feast after feast thus comes and passes by, yet passing points to that glad feast above, giving sweet foretaste of the festal joy the Lamb's great marriage feast of bliss and love. We thank uh, God for, that, for those wonderful verses from a beautiful hymn written more than 100 years ago. So now we come to the next part, which is the construction of the church collectively, chapter 2, verses 11 to 22. Under that, verses 11 and 12 talks about our former alienation, where we were alienated from God, Verse 11, therefore, remember that formerly you were Gentiles by birth, called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision that is done in the body by the hands of men. So in the immediately preceding section, a sharp contrast was drawn between what we once were and what God has done for us. What we once were are given in Ephesians 2, 1 to 3. And what God has done for us is given in Ephesians 4, uh, 2, verses 4 to 10. Now in this section, starting from Ephesians 2, 11, God brings us in contrast to a former position collectively. The previous verses talk about us individually, as individual human beings. Now it talks about us collectively. As Gentiles. Remember the Ephesians were Gentiles like us and the new position that the Gentiles now have in the church, what we have in the body of Christ. Therefore he starts with these words, therefore remember. So in view of the believers present exalted position, why? We are chosen by God, we are elected by God and we are part of God's predestined family, predestination. We are heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. We are sons and daughters of God, now seated in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So this is our present exalted position. Paul also wants us to remember our lowly origin from where we came. Otherwise, we may attribute our present state, our exalted position, to something that we are or we were as the Jews did when they boasted and said in John 8.33, we are Abraham's seed. 
when they were challenged by the Lord, they said, look, we don't have to worry. We are Abraham's children. Means, you know, we are the chosen people. What are you saying? That kind of talk. So all of us are from a lowly position. Remember that he said, mind, mind the sin, but thine the righteousness. We are all sinners saved by God's grace. That formerly you were Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised. Now in this passage, the Spirit of God lists seven things that were true about us in the past. And we will go through all seven. I will not be able to finish all seven today, but let me start off on that. So in order to make us humble, in order to enable us to exalt God and not to exalt ourselves, the Spirit of God gives us these seven things that were true about us in the past. Number one, we were Gentiles by birth. And this is a term that encompasses everyone who is not an Israelite. So obviously we are not Israelites. We are Gentiles by birth. Secondly, we were called uncircumcised. Gentiles by birth and uncircumcised. Now the term Gentiles by birth, we studied a couple of nights ago. That was a, when you talk about a Gentile or when a Jew talks about a Gentile, he always talked about a Gentile in a derogatory fashion. I told you there are two words in Greek for dogs. One is your loving pet dog and the other one is a, a mangy dog, a street dog. Now the, the Jews referred to the Gentiles as a mangy dog. So they really look down upon Gentiles. If a Gentile should come into your house, you become ceremonially unclean and you have to purify yourself. So they really regarded the Gentiles as maybe subhuman. Then we were also called uncircumcised. Now this is also a term of contempt and derision among the Jews. Now let me read to us from 1 Samuel 17 verses 26 and 36. This is David versus Goliath. Now David asked the men standing near him, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. So anyone who was not circumcised was looked down upon by the Jews. Now the rite of circumcision was applied to all Jewish male babies. This meant that the Gentiles did not have the surgical sign in their flesh that marked the Israelites as God's covenant people or God's chosen people. So this is the physical act. The circumcision is the physical act which clearly distinguished between Jew and Gentile. And in this circumcision, the Jews naturally took pride in themselves. By those who call themselves, you are called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision that is done in the body by the hands of men. The Jews, by contrast, they, they call the the Gentiles uncircumcised, they call themselves as the circumcision. In other words, uh, it was a name about which they were very proud. It identified them as God's chosen earthly people, set apart from all the other nations of the earth. Now, however, even though they had this outward sign of uh, God's covenant people, they did not have the inward reality of the faith in the Lord. It was all outside and nothing inside. Sadly, even today, there are many who carry the name of Christ. They do outward things very well, but inside they are not really saved. Romans 2, 28 to 29. A man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly. And circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from men, but from God. So the circumcision of true believers is of the heart. Where we repent of our sins, we get rid of our sins and we move towards God. And it is not 
an outward sign. The outward signs are not very important, especially in the age of grace in which we are living. So God willing, we will continue from Ephesians 2 verse 12 tomorrow, 9 p.m. We meet every night for a Bible study, sharp 9 p.m. Colombo time, five and a half hours ahead of GMT if you're in another part of the world. And we do it every night. And we have been doing it every night since, we, since the lockdown started. So as the Lord wills, we will do it, sharp nine o'clock. So please join with me tomorrow. I will also upload it to my Facebook page. Now let us close in prayer. Oh, glorious Father, we thank you and praise you for what we have learned today. Thank you for, for the clarity of the gospel, Father. For by grace are we saved through faith and not of works, not of ourselves. Lord, we also thank you that we are saved to do good works. We are God's workmanship, saved to do good works, Father, in Christ Jesus. We thank you for this great and glorious privilege to be part of your family. Lord, we continue to pray that you will enable humanity to overcome this unseen enemy. Lord, we are faithful in prayer and we continue to pray that you will give us victory over this uh, virus. We commit Sri Lanka especially into your hands, Father. We pray and ask you that you will rid this country of this terrible virus. We commit these things into your hands in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you and God bless you.